Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary so that they may not pass, so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them, the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The mountains are for the wild goats, the rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons, the sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night. You make all the beasts of the forest creep about. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their, Eden, in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O oh Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord, as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed, brother. Uh, what beautiful, awe-inspiring words. Let's pray now together for the Lord's blessing upon them. Lord, we confess that we are altogether dependent upon you to work your word within our hearts by your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that you would take this text of Scripture that Ryan uh, just read in our hearing and use it to work within us a deeper, more profound sense of gratitude to you for all that we have received from you. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So we are in Thanksgiving mode, right? Uh, we're making our plans. We're looking forward to a little bit of time off. We're starting to think about the food. In my house these days, it's filled with the smell of pumpkin pie as Yvonne has been testing out uh, different recipes for pumpkin pie. Please pray for me. Uh, it is a trial. Uh, we are all about thanksgiving, all about it. But here's the question for us today. Is thanksgiving for you a day or is it a way of life? 
Is it a day or is it a way of life? This is why I chose Psalm 104 for our text today uh, because, I mean, talk about a litany of things to be thankful for. Just amazing. And, and really, it only scratches the surface, right? There are so many other things that we can add to what the psalmist, to the sorts of things that the psalmist is reflecting on here in this passage. Uh, this, is, this is a text that is very important to me personally because there was a time in my life a couple years ago uh, where I was in a, an especially sort of dry place spiritually. You guys know what that's like. You're sort of going through the motions. It's a struggle for you to pray. It's a struggle you, for you to, to, to read the Word. I mean, you're doing things, but your heart just really isn't in it. Uh, but one day I come across this psalm, Psalm 104, and it just pierces my heart as the Lord took these words and showed me through this psalm that really the central sin in my life during these sorts of seasons where, I'm, where I, my heart isn't in it, the central sin usually what is going on is thanklessness. Thanklessness. I, I, you know, yes, I would tell the Lord I was thankful, right? I would sing it, I would pray it, uh, but you guys know, don't you, that there is a huge difference between telling somebody you're thankful and really from the heart being thankful isn't there. The Lord took these words of Psalm 104 and essentially said to me through them, John, right, you keep telling me you're thankful, but I know your heart. I know your heart. And really, being thankful, you know, you, you think about what, what we're talking about here. We're talking about a sincere sense of gratitude as though, you know, you, you pray before meals, right? Many of you I know do. Thank you, Lord, for this food. How many, how many of you, every single time you say those words, thank you, Lord, for this food, are saying it out of a sincere conviction without that, that without the blessing of God to give you that food, you would starve to death? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about giving thanks to God. I owe to Him every single thing that I have. The next breath that I take is out of the sheer good pleasure of God. And this, doing this is not something that comes naturally to us, is it? Uh, why not? Well, there are lots of reasons why it doesn't come naturally to us. At least one of them, especially for us as modern people, right, is, is the fact that really the cultural air that we breathe is atheistic, right? The cultural air that we breathe is atheistic. And what I mean by that, what I mean by that is that the world that we have imagined and sort of created for ourselves is a world that is devoid of the presence of God, we have shut God out of our explanation of how the world works, haven't we? Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Though everything in all of creation shouts the glory and the power and the magnificence of God, we want to say, eh, whatever. <laughs> and see, this is why we so desperately need Psalm 104. This psalm prevents, presents us, you see, with, with an altogether different reality. I mean, take, take something as, as basic and every, and every day in our experience as light. Light. How often do you thank God for giving you light? We have all sorts of explanations for how light works. We think maybe sometimes we think about those explanations, but how often do we give thanks to God? Lord, light. We wouldn't have it without you. Psalm 104 says, right, in verse 2, God has covered himself with light as with a garment and stretched out the heavens. <laughs> you see, the sun, the moon, the stars, the light that illuminates our surroundings, the psalmist wants us to see all of that, all of the light, the light that's in this room right now, the, those spotlights in the corners there that are shining on me, all of those things are just a dim reflection of the pure, radiant light that God is. These things are given to us in order that we might give praise to the God who is light. We ought to have gratitude in our hearts for this. Listen to this. G.K. Chesterton uh, said this, interesting guy from the early 20th century. He said that when it comes to life, 
The critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. When it comes to life, the critical thing is whether you take things for granted or take them with gratitude. Very wise words. And this is why we need Psalm 104, because the message of Psalm 104 really at bottom is that every single thing in the creation that is good is the result of the good work of a good God. Every single thing in all of creation that is good is the result of the good work of a good God. And you and I, brothers and sisters, are called upon to praise Him for it. Praise Him for it. The creation of light, the forming of the earth and the sea, the cycle of water, food, the course of the sun and the moon. The psalmist looks at all of these things, right? He's looking at all of these things. He's reflecting on all of these things. And what is his response? Verse 24, O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom, you have made them all. All of these things are the work of God. And note, they're the work of God not just in the sense that he originally created everything, but also they're the work of God in the sense of what he is currently doing. They're the work of God in terms of his, his, his current, ongoing, present work in the world. See, up to verse 9... The psalmist is reflecting on God's original creation of all things. Genesis 1, he, he formed, uh, he, he created the heavens and the earth. He formed the land and, and the sea, up to verse 9. Then starting in verse 10, there is a shift that takes place where we, where we start looking at God's intimate, ongoing care for all these things that he has made. Look, verse 10, you make, you make present springs gush forth. Verse 13, you water the mountains. Verse 14, you cause grass to grow and, and plants for man to cultivate. Verse 20, you make darkness and it is night. Verse 27, these all look to you to give them their food in due season. Verse uh, 28, when you open your hand, they are filled with good things. Verse 30, when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. And all of that is amazing, isn't it? Amazing. But here's the thing that really struck me most when I was looking at uh, this psalm a couple years ago and still to this day strikes me most about this psalm. These words in verse 31 that are just so easy for us to pass by, verse 31 where the psalmist says, May the Lord rejoice in his works. Do you ever think about God rejoicing? <laughs> How, I mean, God rejoices in what he's done. That just floored me, right? I mean, think about that, right? God rejoices. He, you know, you think about what he says over and over in Genesis 1, and God said, it is good. That's not just a statement of fact, right? That is a statement of delight. God looks at the things that he does and says, that is good, right? That is good. And you and me, when we give thanks to God for the things that he's done, for the works of his hands, when we speak our, it is good to God, what are we doing? We are but reflecting the, rejo the, the rejoicing and the, the delight of God in his creation, right? Our, it is good, is an echo of God's, it is good. And so the psalmist shows us what the cry of our hearts really should be, right, in verses 33 and 34. What the cry of our hearts should be. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to Him, for I rejoice in the Lord. As long as God gives me breath, I will use that breath that He gives to praise His name. That should be the cry of our hearts. His deepest desire, you see, is for the glory of God to be clearly seen and for His worship to be something that is sort of taken up in this grand chorus, chorus of creation that brings delight to the heart of God, right? May the praise that I offer be something that is, that is seen by you, O God, just like all of the works of your hands be seen by you as something to rejoice in. <laughs> Verse 35 may seem a little bit weird to you, but this is actually where verse 35 comes in. It says, Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. 
praise the Lord. What in the world? Why? <laughs> Why end this, this psalm that's going on for 34 verses about all these beautiful things that God does with this one verse prayer for the wicked to be consumed? Why? Here's why, and it's actually very important. I would suggest it's possibly the most important thing here. This is the only way, the only way as the world as it currently now exists is, this is the only way that God's glory will cover the earth fully. It is the only way ultimately that God will receive the praise that is his due. Right, for God's kingdom to come fully his enemies must be destroyed. You see, all of these things that Psalm 104 talks about are true, yes, but they are not the whole of the story, are they? Because there is something that has infected God's good creation that threatens it. What is that? Sin and the curse of death have come in and have infected and threaten to destroy this good world that God has made. And so Romans 8 says that the whole creation groans with longing for its liberation from captivity. Right? God made everything good. We have made a mess of it. And in such a world, right, something has got to give. Good and evil cannot exist side by side indefinitely on an equilibrium. One of them is going to win out eventually. And so in order for the good to flourish, what needs to happen? In order for the good to flourish, the evil needs to be eradicated. And beloved, this is what God is doing in our Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, He is consuming sin and wickedness. The things that, that threaten to consume the good world that He has made. In other words, He is answering the prayer of Psalm 35. But here's the thing, and this is the glory of the gospel. This is the glory of the gospel in Jesus. He is doing it in such a way that is far greater than anybody could have ever imagined. Far greater because what is he doing? In Jesus, God destroys sin and wickedness while sparing wicked sinners. Amazing. That is what God does in Jesus. This is how he is answering the prayer of verse 35 of Psalm 104. Talk about something to be thankful for. See, without Jesus, how would that prayer be answered? Let the wicked be consumed and the sinners be no more. We would be wiped out. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That would be us. We would be consumed. We would be no more if without Jesus, God would answer this verse, would answer this prayer. Without Jesus. But you see, what Jesus did was he took that curse of sin and death upon himself, became sin for us so that our sin and our death would be swallowed up in the unfathomable sea of his mercy. That's the gospel. That is the gospel. God is bringing a new creation and he is starting with you and me. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. The new has come. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that you today? Is that you today? That is what it means to be a part of the new creation that God is bringing in Jesus Christ. And it is glorious. And you see, the thing that we know in light of that is that all of these things in Psalm 104, these wonderful things that God is doing, they're, they're things to give praise and thanks and, and wonder at now in our lives. But imagine how glorious all of these things will be in a world that is devoid of sin and death and evil and wickedness. Where you will just burst forth Every day, ongoing, never-ending praise to God, freed from your sins, freed from the pain, freed from the struggle. So then, this is the time of year for giving thanks, but thanksgiving needs to be for us, beloved, as the people of God, not just a day in the year, but a way of life. If we are going to be the people that God calls us to be, then every day should be a thanksgiving day. Every day should be a day for thanksgiving. Thankfulness, you need to see, should be the heartbeat of your soul. The heartbeat of, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's what your soul should sound like. Why doesn't that happen? 
The problem is that we have a severe case of irregular heartbeat, right? And, and, and we need God. We need God to take the defibrillator of His Word and shock us back into reality so that that rhythm would be regained in our lives. And that's what I would suggest to you that He is seeking to do for you in Psalm 104, to shock you back into a rhythm in your life of just ongoing thankfulness for His gifts. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights with, how, with, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. You see, beloved, God has created the church to be a family of thanker, thankers. A family of thankers. I was going to say thinkers. Uh, that's what people think about a lot of times when they think about Presbyterians. But no, a family of thankers. A family of thankers. And brothers and sisters, if he is going to get the thanks that is his due in the world, if God is going to get the thanks that is his due in Willow Grove, Pennsylvania, then it's going to have to be from you and me. We need to be those who live lives of thankfulness before our neighbors to God for all that he has done for us. So where is your, thankful, your thankfulness today? Where is your thankfulness? Are you in your life a thanker of God? Is thankfulness the heartbeat of your soul? In a little while, you're going to have an opportunity to publicly express your thankfulness uh, to the Lord for things in your life that are blessings. Uh, and I would encourage you, don't be shy. This is a family gathering. This is a family gathering. But before we do that, we're going to eat our Thanksgiving meal, which is really what the, Lord, the Lord's Supper is. It is our thanksgiving feast. No, there's no turkey on the table. <laughs> there, there's, there's no yams. There's no, uh, sweet, there's no uh, mashed potatoes. There's no pumpkin pie. It's just a loaf of bread and little cups of juice. But the Lord's Supper is the meal that gives meaning to all other meals for us, beloved, because the Lord's Supper is the meal where Jesus is offering to you the food of eternal life. Food and drink that will never leave you hungry or thirsty, that will never perish, that will fill you up, that will satisfy your deepest longings. This is why we actually hear the word, the Lord's Supper referred to from time to time as the Eucharist, right? You've heard that word before. The word Eucharist is just from the Greek word for Thanksgiving, Eucharistia. Uh, it means, Eucharist means Thanksgiving. That's what it is. And so as we move toward the Lord's table now, I want you to consider this from Psalm 104. Consider this. It is interesting, isn't it? As you go through the litany of gifts that God gives us, we read this smack dab in the middle, verse 15. We read this. Wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. And it's worth pointing out, right, that these, these things aren't just bare necessities, right? Yes, bread is necessary food, but wine and oil are luxuries, aren't they? Wine to gladden man's heart, uh, oil to make his face shine, right? God, see, God gives you things not just to sustain your life, but also to make life more pleasant, to make life more enjoyable. And you see... This is something he does supremely in Jesus Christ, isn't it? In Jesus, God gives us not just what we need to keep on living. In Jesus, he gives us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. In Jesus, he gives a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. In Jesus, there is a, a superabundant store of grace for you beyond just what you need to keep on living. And so, wine, oil, bread, these are things, good gifts that just considered in themselves, they're things to be, to be thankful for, aren't they? But you see, in the gospel, these ordinary gifts are taken up in the extraordinary story of our redemption as they represent to us our Lord Jesus Christ. The wine representing the blood of Jesus, blood that was spilled not not by the, the crushing of grapes, but by the precious body of our Lord Jesus Christ as his body was crushed and his blood poured out for you to gladden your heart by giving you an imperishable joy. The bread representing the body of Jesus, weakened and broken in order that you might be strengthened and made whole in him. What about the oil? What's that about? Well, not to get too mystical on you guys here, but 
1 John 2.20 says that you have been anointed by the Holy One. You see, oil is a picture of the fact that you have been anointed by the Holy Spirit. God has given to you the Holy Spirit, which is the thing that fills these elements that we are about to receive today with meaning. The Holy Spirit gives you Jesus and gives you to Jesus. What a glorious thing. And the Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies our hearts that they might be vessels of thankfulness to our God. And through the Holy Spirit, you, beloved, can in your life pray every time you approach this table and every single day of your life. By the grace of the Spirit of God, you can say the words of David in Psalm 23. Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. And surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And beloved, if ever there has been something to be thankful for, <laughs> that is it. Amen.